We refer to this as actor-oriented organizing. Our most recent project is a book that we are co-writing and co-editing called Designing Adaptive Organizations, which will be published later this year by Cambridge University Press. And, and, and could I cue that slide, Rushika, the first one? One of the chapters in our book is called The Open Organization, and it describes how organizations in general have evolved over the past several decades. As this slide indicates, modern organizations are quite different from traditional organizations. So if you glance at those bullets, you can see that compared to a, what might be called closed organization, one that's uh, uh, only searches among its own resources and not very widely in the environment, but basically uh, has created stability in its situation and operates that way. Uh, modern organizations uh, search for resources wherever they may exist. Uh, they co-produce products and services with suppliers, partners, and customers. Uh, they form uh, teams of human actors and combine them with digital actors and uh, those actors in tandem are uh, empowered to self-organize their resources and infrastructures, facilitative leadership and other enabling mechanisms are there to support task uh, performance. Um, and if you show the next slide, uh, we argue in this book that if organizations are going to continue to open up and to seek more resources wherever they may exist and link up with those partners to utilize those resources. Um, the organization design paradigm that uh, uh, helps actors form their organizations is going to have to shift as well. And uh, I think one could make a case that um, there is a new paradigm, there is or should be a new organization design par paradigm and our actor-oriented version of it is an administrative technology in which actors and their relationships with other actors are the basis of organizing. So the difference here between traditional organization design, which basically specifies the features of known organization designs and is a design process where someone external to the situation uh, designs for that situation the new paradigm enables actors to do their own uh, self-organizing. And if our field of organization design is going to keep pace with what organizations are doing, uh, we believe and, and try to argue in this book that uh, the organization design paradigm is going to have to shift as well to one where you help the actors organize their teams, their resources, and as a result, instead of specifying a structure, structure will be constantly emerging from the interactions among the actors themselves. Um, now I'd like to turn the presentation over to Oystein, who will introduce Paul and describe how they came to work together in the healthcare sector. Thank you, uh, Chuck. Um, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be with you. And I am very pleased to uh, introduce Professor Paul Botalden, MD. Paul is Professor Emeritus at the Geisel School of Medicine at uh, Dartmouth. He is a leader in healthcare improvement. He is the found, founding chairman of the board of Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a large global organization dedicated to the improvement of healthcare. Uh, he is the um, uh, former vice president of Hospital Corporation of America and a former assistant surgeon general to the US government. I have had the pleasure of working with Paul since 2011 on two streams of research, one on value creation in healthcare 
and the second on organizing and leading learning uh, healthcare networks. We are in the process at the moment of uh, finalizing an article on the last topic. Uh, the most mature learning health networks, uh, such as Improved Care Now, uh, cons uh, consisting of 105 hospitals, uh, all use an actor-oriented organizational architecture. Um, as uh, Chuck mentioned a little earlier. These highly effective networks represent successful co collaborations among patients, families, clinicians, researchers, and health system leaders. And to look at the effect of some of these, a recent study published in Health Affairs documented an improvement in remission rates over five years for chronically ill children from 55 to 77 percent, markedly reducing the burden of suffering for very ill children. With this, I turn it over to you, Paul. May I suggest that you start by giving us a brief overview of your extensive efforts at improving health and healthcare services over the years, and we are very happy to have you here with us today. Thank you very much, uh, Charles and Oyston. It's a privilege to be with you uh, folks and to uh, share uh, some of the uh, impressions that uh, have been mine as I have had the privilege of working in many different roles in healthcare services. I've had the privilege of working in public health. I've had the privilege of working in organizational leadership and development. I've had the privilege of being a direct patient care provider. And I've been uh, working at the leadership of improvement in, in many different and change in, in many different uh, organizational settings. For the past two and a half decades, I've been both an educator and a researcher at Dartmouth Medical School uh, in, uh, in the US and uh, at Jönköping, Sweden, uh, where I have also uh, worked with the Jönköping Academy uh, for the improvement of health and welfare. So what I've uh, tried to put together for you folks is a, 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 an introduction to some of these ideas so that uh, we might uh, begin to establish a, a way of having conversations that uh, I think are, are very necessary as we um, confront the situation that we face in healthcare. And one way of thinking about that situation is uh, as if we look at the, just the very recent reports that have been put out, the OECD reports that 15% of all hospital costs are due to patient harms from adverse events. Three international studies that were done, published in 2018, suggested that uh, uh, eight, there are 8 million unnecessary deaths and numerous kinds of uh, shortfalls that exist uh, throughout the world. Uh, today, the US National Academy of Medicine is uh, putting out a series on what they call vital directions, which focus on um, the documented inequities of uh, healthcare uh, service access, financing and outcomes, uh, excessive uh, and unnecessary costs, inadequate mental health treatment, inadequate geriatric care, and uh, uh, excessive uh, drug costs. Uh, we've seen at the same time many promising pockets of gain that have existed in, in uh, uh, these healthcare systems. But if we generally apply them, Uwe Reinhardt, the, the, the late professor of economics at Princeton was fond of saying, Soon, what we will all be doing is buying and selling healthcare to each other because we will have taken over all the economic resources that exist. Jeffrey Braithwaite in Australia is fond of saying, you really have to just remember three numbers, 60, 30, and 10. It's 60% of the healthcare services that are given directly in response to the evidence that science has provided for a situation like that. 30, uh, it's 30% 30 of the uh, uh, resources and care exercises that go on are uh, also describable as waste. And 10% uh, uh, 
which uh, directly result in harm. So 60, 30, and 10. So I've been working on trying to uh, uh, change or improve uh, that situation. As I was reflecting on the last 100 years of our effort to try to make healthcare better, there was a period which we'll describe as Q1.0 when we focused on the question, how might we establish thresholds for good healthcare service so that we could recognize a good hospital or a good clinic. And in, in 1920, the American College of Surgery sort of developed a set of minimal standards, which they then built and used in, in hospitals uh, uh, throughout the US. And that was widely uh, adopted and adapted uh, both in Canada and elsewhere. And uh, it, it involved a, a, a series of programs of standards and inspection and certification and, and guidelines that, uh, that developed. But about in the mid 80s or so, some of us recognized that there were gains in, in quality that were possible in economic sectors that were different than healthcare settings. And what we realized was that there, was, there were enterprise-wide systems that were at work for achieving these improvements in quality and value and safety. And uh, we began to ad adapt those uh, uh, ways of thinking and working. Uh, and the question changed from how might we establish thresholds for recognizing good hospitals and good clinics to how might we use enterprise-wide systems for best disease management? And we learned a lot in the process. Uh, we learned about systems and processes and reliability and customer supplier and uh, uh, performance measurement and so on. And as I was stepping down from the uh, board of the IHI after 25 years, and I, I think no one should be on a board for more than 25 years, and so, uh, I, I, I was asking myself, well, do we know what we need to know for the next 25 years? Uh, we've learned a lot in the last 25 years as we've been sort of trying to explore this, but, and I realized that the, that the question uh, that we were working on back in the mid eighties, how might we use enterprise wide systems for best disease management had actually been, been transformed into a question that was something more like, how might we improve the value of the contribution that healthcare service makes to health? It's a little like the question that Chuck opened up about how might your field actually make a contribution of value to the emerging uh, organizations as they are now working. But uh, it, that opened for me uh, a deep curiosity about this uh, uh, term service and value and and, and, and made me think about, well, who owns someone's health? Is it ever possible to outsource your health to somebody else? Well, if it's not, then what's the job of a, a professional? Or now that we can get access to information quite easily, how do we, how do we think about the work of professionals as they do this? And it, it strikes me that this was, I mean, the temptation of course is to think that when we have quality 2.0, then we don't need quality 1.0, but that's not true. I think these, it's, it's really a matter of adding these together. It's not substituting one uh, for another. But uh, if that frame of, uh, it's trying to put a hundred years in one picture. And so uh, it, it's always got limits, but uh, my sense was that um, I was then uh, beginning to work on this journey about, so what does service and what does value mean? And then COVID came. And co COVID was really a high stakes teacher for me because it, thankfully I have not struggled with that uh, illness myself, but it's helped me see that um, we, we can, the way we build new knowledge uh, uh, in just a year that we've been working to try to understand what uh, COVID-19 is. And uh, we've had a historic uh, love affair with randomized controlled trials or RCTs. And uh, it's not been time to, to, to do these RCTs, but yet we've built a lot of understanding about this disease and about the way it actually uh, 
works. And we've also seen that professionals alone have not been able to eradicate the problem. Um, we've seen lots of forces that exist in the, in the context that, that uh, influence our, our uh, cooperative uh, efforts to distance and wear masks and, and so on. And I'm reminded of Carr White, who was the president of the Rockefeller Foundation and an epidemiologist many years ago, who said basically that there was a schism, uh, a big separation between personal and public health efforts. And we've never seen it more clearly than uh, today in uh, the wake of uh, COVID. It's been easier for us to create measures of the of the uh, outcomes, be, but because we lack a good model for the causal uh, factors that are at work completely, it's been much more difficult to create useful measures of the process uh, 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 as we uh, keep talking about the outcomes from this perspective or that perspective. And uh, what's happening right now is that we have a group of people who doctors and nurses who who uh, in some places are looked at as heroes, but in other places they're looked at as enemies. And what is very clear to me is that they are progressively exhausted as they try to struggle to hold systems that were poorly designed to work together uh, together as they, as, they, as they do their work. And we have leaders and politicians who seem captive to irrelevant theories and, and assumptions uh, uh, we sort of lead the world in the U.S. Uh, with that uh, uh, phenomenon in our in the last incumbent in our president's office, uh, and it's not always clear whose interests these politicians are serving. Whether they're serving our interests as uh, citizens, or whether they're serving uh, some private interests. We've seen an information age that brings capacity and huge engines that can be used to offer information and misinformation and even disinformation as we, as we see the way that that's uh, uh, playing itself out. Some have described it as participatory disinformation when we post stuff that isn't uh, true on uh, social media and move that around as if it were uh, useful for people. In the process, we've also recognized that at a, at a base level, we are kin one to another. We are both people. We, we, we in fact, uh, have a need to help one another and to work uh, together with uh, uh, one another. We've seen change happen much more rapidly than before. Organizations that had debated for four years the use of digital exchange in the course of, of uh, uh, patient care uh, adopt and within three weeks change all their appointments to uh, virtual uh, appointments and uh, nobody quite thought that was possible before. We've seen people uh, working together and we know that people need to work together and in order to work together they need respect and trust and some kind of uh, shared learning as they engage in both innovation and constructive alternatives and to do that, some slack is really necessary in order to allow for this adaptive work uh, to actually go on. I was thinking that if uh, Aristotle could see what was going on, he would be happy that we are still playing out episteme, techne, and phronesis, his cardinal ways of uh, knowing. So COVID has been this amazing teacher, but I was on this journey to try to understand service and value. And I realized that what we 